So preliminarily, I'm going to lay out some history for you. When we talk about Daniel, there is history, there is prophecy, and there's fulfilled prophecy, and there's unfulfilled prophecy. That's the way it goes. So historically, it is important to understand where we're at. Now, what I gave you was a very simple handout. You can write on this if you want. It's just, in a sense, the, the order of things we're going to talk about. Our goal will be, starting in a few minutes, we're going to read the entire book of Daniel. We're going to let it interpret itself. We're going to let it talk itself. You're going to see that it makes things very clear. But preliminarily, the first verse of the book says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. This is the context historically that we're dealing with. Now, in the history of Israel, there are multiple nations that oppressed it, beginning with Egypt. Everybody knows the story. Moses led them out of bondage in Egypt, right? Secondarily was the kingdom that we call Assyria. And there's maps in there for you that give you an idea of the context of these things, and we're going to be looking at those in detail shortly. Then the kingdom of Assyria came. What did the kingdom of Assyria accomplish? It destroyed the northern kingdom. You may be aware that Israel, under David, was united as a great kingdom. Solomon took that kingdom to greater heights. It was much more powerful than many in secular history will tell you today. The reason why is because they're all confused about what happened when. If you look at ancient chronology, it's not as simple as we know that President Obama followed President Bush, who followed President Clinton, who followed President Bush, who followed President Reagan. We got all that clear. We know what years they were. We know when they took office. It's all detailed. You go back in history, they talk about King so-and-so reigned so many years, but sometimes they reigned in parallel, sometimes they reigned with their father, sometimes they were regents, sometimes they were various things. Then the, many of the documents we have are not complete. It'll say King, you know, King Obama reigned here, and then it'll say then the, the, some king, but you can't read the name, and it'll have a, a year length, and then there'll be some other one, and then there'll be a name, but no year length. And you have these very confusing documents in history. And so people are trying to put ancient history together. And they make a lot of errors. Most people who study this stuff know that the errors exist and that they're significant. But nobody can agree on the exact way to put them back together. So if you do what I've done for 20 years and study just ancient historical documents and how it works, you'll find out that there's no agreement. None. So when you hear people speak with great authority, oh, it happened this way, they're often not quite correct or they're uncertain, except for one document. In every situation that it's been able to be found out, the Bible is correct every time you look at it. There have been many times when people have said, oh, the Bible is wrong. It's obviously wrong, something's wrong. Then they go dig a little further, find a new document, find a new stela someplace, some piece of stone with words carved in it that they interpret, and they go, oh, you know what? The Bible was right all along. Every single time. People won't tell you that because they're stuck on their messed up chronologies. They're stuck on them. You know, you, you watch the Ten Commandments movie. Most people have seen the Ten Commandments of Charlton Heston. He makes a great Moses, but the history is all messed up. They've got him in the time of Ramses, the 18th dynasty of Egypt. I'm going to tell you right now, it happened long before Ramses was born. I know that for a fact. People can argue about exactly when, but it happened long before. People will tell you that Joseph occurred sometime around you know, the time after the pyramids and whatever. I'm telling you, Joseph probably helped to build the pyramids. Okay? But these are not things that are fully accepted by people. So when we talk about the Bible, we're going to just say what the Bible says and know that it's correct. It is the most accurate ancient document that exists today. Absolutely, that is a fact. Anybody who's looked at it knows it to be true. It is the most 
well cared for. It is, has the most copies. It has the most ancient copies. It has the most clarity. The agreement between a copy from Ethiopia and a copy from uh, you know, somewhere up in, in Spain and another copy over in some place. The, the agreement is absolutely incredible. They can't get that kind of agreement in Homer's Iliad. It's not even close. You cannot find Shakespeare that's that good. And that's 1600s AD. They we're talking about stuff from 1600 BC. It's got agreement. So that's important to understand. That's preliminary to, to knowing what's going on here. Because we have to recognize that if you study this stuff in secular history, it would get a little confusing as to who's who and what's what. And I'm going to be talking about it in a way that I believe is true. So this starts with the fact that there was the kingdom of Egypt that oppressed Israel. We all know the story. The kingdom of Assyria that oppressed Israel and conquered the northern kingdom. So I was talking about the fact that there were two kingdoms. After Solomon, it was split into two. And those two kingdoms, the southern kingdom we typically call Judah, and the northern kingdom was called Israel. And there was an enmity between the two kingdoms, but there are times in the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles they work together. There are times they work apart. But that kingdom of Solomon was so mighty that he affected the whole world around him. The Egyptians were affected. The Assyrians were affected. But it's not believed by secular historians because they got him in the wrong time. That was my point of all that discussion. Them in the wrong time. So they don't quite see what his effect was. Well, having said that, then it was divided. Well, the kingdom of the Assyrians came down and conquered the northern kingdom and took it captivity and dispersed it. There were many people from that kingdom that escaped down into Judah. There were many righteous people who had probably left that kingdom come to Judah sometime before. And they were now congregated in a much smaller kingdom of Judah. And that's where we are when this occurs. Nebuchadnezzar now is the king of Babylon. Babylon is very similar to Assyria in location. In fact, if you go back before Nebuchadnezzar, there are kings of Babylon that are listed, you know, the name might be, you know, Joseph, and over here there's a kingdom, Joe, a guy named Joe who's the king of Assyria. They're probably the same guy. And so there was a lot of overlap for a while. But the Assyrians were overtaken by the city-state of Babylon and became the kingdom of Babylon. And so where we begin at this point in the book of Daniel is Daniel is led captive from Judah. He is removed to Babylon. And we're going to talk about what happens with him. Historically, that's what's going on. Judah is conquered, wiped out, put down. Most people agree what year that was. It was a specific year, happened, and completely taken over. Israel is no more this point it's gone it's people that are left are captive in babylon and nebuchadnezzar is the king the great king so what happens in the book of daniel is god begins to reveal to this righteous man named daniel what is going to occur he's going to show him because god has a purpose on the earth his purpose is to bring an end to sin his purpose is to bring an end to rebellion against his rule on the earth. That's his purpose. And in that purpose, he's going to accomplish what he intends to do. And as he does it, he's showing Daniel, here's what's going to happen with your people. Daniel is unique because he is listed as one of the great people of all time in terms of uh, his his goodness his his righteousness he's listed ezekiel chapter 14 you can write that down go read it and you'll read about daniel and job noah as the most righteous men and god says the wickedness of your land is so great that even if daniel and job and noah were in it it would not be saved that's how wicked you guys have become it's pretty it's pretty bad but that's who Daniel is. I mean, he's listed this. He's a great man. There is an apocryphal section 
What an apocrypha is, is books where people don't include them in the Holy Scripture. We believe the Scripture is inspired of the Holy Ghost, and it's true in all of its particulars, in everything that it says. The apocrypha was believed by some to be Holy Scriptures, believed by others not to be, and so in the typical Protestant Bible, it no longer occurs. And I've heard lots of stories about why that is, but in your typical Catholic Bible, you can find the Old Testament Apocrypha. This is not to be confused with the New Testament Apocrypha. But included in that are some stories that embellish the book of Daniel. Two of them are about Daniel himself, Daniel and a woman named Susanna, and how he saves her from being killed by unrighteous judges who declare that she did something she didn't do. And another one where there's an altar to a great snake that the Babylonians worshipped at the time, and Daniel figures out how they were making it look like something supernatural was fine going on. He was the first skeptic who went and said, no, that ain't happening, and he figured out they had a secret door, and they were coming in and acting like the god was actually eating the food. And that story is in there. So this, they used to be that the Susanna story was at the beginning of Daniel, and the bell and the dragon story was at the end of, the, of Daniel, but they're no longer concluded there, but you can find them in an Old Testament apocrypha. They give us insight into who Daniel was. But the best part of that Apocrypha is that um, there's a story of the detail of the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. And when we get to that, we'll talk about it. Okay. I thought somebody was signaling. So that's preliminary so that you understand the landscape. So did we get the slides up? We did. Stunning. Go back to that preliminary side. So the Empire of Babylon, Umber Nebuchadnezzar, is the empire that we're dealing with to begin with. And the other thing, I already told you, but the book is a revelation of what's going to come to pass for Israel. That's who it's about. And when will salvation come? I told you about Daniel and Ezekiel 14 because I think it's important to know who he was. And uh, then I told you about the Apocrypha. So those are the preliminaries to give everybody who's going to be late a chance to get in here, get started and get all our stuff set up. That's the context. Now, many of you have different abilities of understanding of ancient history and locations and geography, so we're gonna go really slow and explain those things as we go. So let me do this. Any questions to begin with? Everybody's on page? What I intend to do today is go for somewhere in the neighborhood of an hour, take a break, do another hour, take a break, do however long it takes, take a break and answer any questions people have. That's the plan, to get this thing done, okay? So if there are gonna be times we're gonna be moving really fast. If you feel like you're not following and you don't understand, just raise your hand, okay? And we'll stop and explain as we go. But you'll find that it's extremely easy to understand. So go to slide, the next slide. We're gonna start off with basic things mostly about Daniel. And we're going to start in chapter 1, verse 1. You now understand what it means that in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim. Let me tell you, this is not the final captivity. When Nebuchadnezzar came, he, he came over to Jehoiakim and Judah and said, I've beaten you, you lose, I'm taking your best people and I'm taking your gold and I'm leaving and you're my state, you do what I tell you. And Jehoiakim says, yes, 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 sir, don't kill me now. And so when Daniel was taken, and Ezekiel was probably part of this group too, when he was taken, they were taken to Babylon before Judah was completely destroyed. So at the time this is happening, it'll say the third year of Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim lived a few more years, reigned a few more years, but he rebelled because he thought Egypt would help him. That's really what happened. He thought Egypt would help him, but Egypt didn't help him, and Nebuchadnezzar came down and wiped the kingdom out. Okay. But in this third year, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and be besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar. Shinar is another name for Babylon, by the way. So he took that to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So he had a God that he worshipped, and he would bring treasures from conquered nations, and he'd put them in there to prove that his God was stronger than their God. And this was the way... Assyria worked. If you study ancient Assyria history, they were constantly fighting over, my God's better than your God. That's what they would do. 
okay? And that, so that's what you did. You brought all the stuff you stole from the people you conquered and put it in the house of your God to prove that your God had more stuff than their God because your God was stronger. That's what he's doing, okay? And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, well-favored, skillful in wisdom, cunning in knowledge, understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans. So one of the things you want to do when you conquer a people is you want to get them to think like you think. Right? That's what you want to do. So when you, you know, if we could go in and conquer a nation and then change everybody to think the way we think, we could make that nation friends with us because we all now think alike, right? Now that's something the United States never really did. We don't take what we think and stick it other places generally, do it a little bit. But in the past, that was the way you did things. You go in and you, you change everything. You wipe out, you kill all the people that know stuff about their own history and you teach them yours. So that's what he's doing. He's gonna take some very intelligent young men of Israel and he's gonna come and teach them all the learning of the Chaldeans. Because after all, the Chaldeans know more than everybody else when to teach that to them. So Daniel's part of that group and his three friends are part of that group that's brought over there because they're well-favored young men in the king's house, very bright, very smart. Verse five, the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat. So what he would do, remember, if you're gonna eat, you gotta get food someplace. So one of the best places to get food in those days, and it still is for a lot of people, is you get a government job, okay? So if, you're in, if you got a government job, then you get appointed, you're gonna get so much food. So they were provided for, so that they could not have to worry about getting food, so that they could do the things the king wanted them to do. Questions? Um, it doesn't tell us. doesn't tell us that they were or they were not. They were assigned to the head of the eunuchs. Yeah, they very well may have been. And, you know, there may be some people who think they know that for a fact, but it doesn't say that. It never tells us that Daniel and his three friends were made eunuchs. They very well may have been, okay? Because they were supposed to be soothsayers and uh, dream interpreters and people who gave counsel and measured things and evaluated things using all of these abilities, you know, skillful in wisdom and knowledge and science and had ability. And so the king appoints them provision and of the wine which he drank, nourishing them three years that at the end they might stand before the king. So now we're not only gonna take you and teach you our ways, we're gonna have you eat our food. That's the other thing we're gonna do for three years. I mean, it's a long time. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. He gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abadnego. These are the, the names that were given. Those are the ones most people remember from little songs and stuff when they were kids. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. So wh what does that mean? In Israel, he had a law. There were things you ate, and there were things you did not eat. And he knew those laws very well, and he purposed in his heart, I am not going to defile myself. I am going to keep the laws of my God. I am not going to give myself to that which is wrong. I cannot do these things. So he purposed it, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. said, I don't want to defile myself with this meat that you provided for me. I mean, thank you very much, but no, I don't want to eat this. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. You know, the anointing will give you favor with people. It's pretty amazing. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king. He's appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? In other words, why would I want you to look less healthy than the others? I'm afraid of the king. If I bring you before the king in three years and you've not been fattened up and eaten like you're supposed to, um, I, you're going to look worse than the other guys, and I can't have that happen. Then shall you make me endanger my head. See, this is what his interest is. The king would take my head because I didn't do what he told me to do. And then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, prove thy servants. I beseech you 10 days, 
Let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Pulse is basically a vegetarian mix, okay? Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with your servants. He says, give me 10 days. Let us eat our food. You feed them your food and we'll see who looks best. You decide. He said, you judge it. You decide. And at the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which ate the portion of the king's meat. God will come through for you when you stand for him. That's the best. This is who Daniel was. When you read about the Susanna story in the Apocrypha, Daniel stood up and said, these judges are lying. He knew by the Spirit of God they were lying. And he knew how to prove it. And he went and he got them to, to testify against one another. He divided them and conquered them asking them a question that they each answered differently because they had said that we both saw it at the same place at the same time. He asked them, what kind of tree was it under? And the one said it was under this kind of tree and the other one said separately it's under this kind of tree. And so basically they testified against one another and because they had lied about her. They, they wanted her to commit sin with them. She refused, so they said that he, she had committed sin with somebody else who couldn't be found, you know. It's that kind of story. So... Daniel understood very clearly that if you stand with God, he'll take care of you. Susanna stood with God. She committed herself to God, said, I put my trust in you, Lord. You know that they're lying and you know that I've been unfairly accused. And Daniel stood up in the spirit of God and got her out of it. God will take care of you if you just be firm, though it all looks bad. It looked bad here. He's going to make us defile ourselves because we're going to look bad. No, I, tr I trust my God, so I'll tell you what, we're going to follow our God's laws and you, you judge. And so the judgment is they were better. So this is an important part of the story. It's who Daniel is. So we want to know more about him. So he consented. At the end of 10 days, they were fair. Verse 16, Melza Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. So three years later, he brings them in. They've been taught all the learning of the Chaldeans, whatever. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even under the first year of King Cyrus. So what I put up here, see if this thing reaches. It doesn't reach. But you can see it. The two things that are important about Daniel. He purposed in his heart not to defile himself against the law of God. And in all matters, he was found to be about 10 times better than everybody else. He purposed himself. That's who Daniel is. That's what this book starts out telling us. Who is Daniel? That's who he is. Now it says that Daniel continued the first year of King Cyrus, so we're back to history for a moment. King Cyrus the Great was the first mighty king of Persia. Okay, He wasn't the first king of the Persian Empire or the first king of the Medes, but he was the first mighty king of Persia at the time in which Babylon is defeated. And this is going to become important. So I want you to understand that what they're telling you here is Daniel continued to be the greatest in Babylon until Cyrus came and took over. And what we're going to find out is Daniel has to go through this whole thing all over again. But we'll get there. Close enough. Okay, so any questions about Daniel so far? See, we got one out of 12 chapters done already. Isn't that amazing? Chapter 2, verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep brake from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, Chaldeans, to show the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream. My spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. And the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. And if you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. That's pretty rough. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and the interpretation. 
that's a pretty tough road to go. Yeah, let, excuse me. Let me think of that, what that dream is. Uh, I mean, these guys are, they're struggling. They do not know what to do. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that you would gain the time because you see the thing is gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I will know that you can show me the interpretation. So he's, he's, this dream means so much to him that he, he wants to make sure these guys aren't just lying to him. Because, you know, it's really easy to take people's dreams and make up interpretations. People did it all the time. They did back then all the time. And he doesn't want that. At verse 10, the Chaldeans answered before the king, said, there is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. You can't ask this. There's nobody can do this. And it is a rare thing that the king requires. There is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause, the king was angry, very furious, and commanded to destroy all the wise men in Babylon. There's only one problem with that. Daniel's one of those guys. He, he wasn't there, by the way. He wasn't there. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. You're part of the crowd. All right, we're, we're getting y'all. Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. So now Daniel, for the first time, hears the problem. Mm -hmm. Then Daniel went in, desired of the king that he would give him time and he, that he would show the king the interpretation. So in boldness, Daniel says, excuse me, let me go see the king. Goes into the king and says, I will make known the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Daniel knew something that the wise men of Babylon did not know. He knew God. And so he told his friends, you pray, I'm going to go seek God, and we're going to find out what God has to say, because God knows. Now look at what God, what God has allowed to be set up here. The Chaldeans and astrologers have already told the king, there's no man on earth can do this. It is impossible. So it's all been set up for Daniel to come and do it. Isn't that great? It's amazing. I love this stuff. So, and he, verse 18, he said, you know, that they would desire mercy of the God of heaven concerning the secret, God of heaven concerning the secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. He gave thanks. Isn't that so wonderful? He gave thanks. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times, the seasons, he removes kings, sets up kings, he gives wisdom unto the wise, knowledge to them that know understanding. I mean, he's just reveling in the wonders of God. He reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for you have made, now made known unto us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, said this unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered, said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, magicians, soothsayers show unto the king, but there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions thy head upon thy bed are these. So we have chapter two up here, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Now all the stuff we've read so far is very important to understand how God set this up. This is all of God. He's making known the latter days. Do you hear that? He says right there, verse 28, He's making known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream is this. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed what should come to pass hereafter, and he that reveals secrets makes known to thee what shall come to pass. 
But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any other living person, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation of the king, and that thou might know the thoughts of thy heart. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. There's our image over there. You can see it on your paper. You can see it up there. It's not very big at this moment. We'll have another picture later. Um, he said, this is the image. This great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image head was of fine gold. So you'll see the different colors. Your picture won't have it, but different colors. It's gold. His breast, his arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet partly iron and partly clay. You saw till a stone was cut out without hands. You got the little stone there. Cut out without hands. Um, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, break them to pieces, and then all the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold were broken in pieces together, became like the chaff of a threshing floor in the summer, and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, filled the whole earth. So there's the dream. This is the dream. Now, do we have to figure out what it means? No. The Bible is extremely good about interpreting its own stuff. So right after this in Daniel, no confusion, here's the interpretation. Oh, that thou, O king, verse 37, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory, and wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, has he given into thine hand and has made thee ruler over them all, you are the head of gold. So you'll see written over there, head of gold is Nebuchadnezzar, parenthesis, Babylon. You are that. Okay? I just lost my place, excuse me. Um, in verse 39, after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to you, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things, and as iron that breaks all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas you saw the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Now, we're going to get into this more. He's telling us a lot about this. There's going to be more to say about this. But notice how much time he just spent on the toes. You know, it's real quick. You're the head of gold after you comes one of silver, then comes one of brass, and then there's going to come this one of iron, and then he spends all this time talking about the toes. Daniel's going to get very questioning about the toes with God later. He's going to want to know more about the toes. He's going to ask God specifically about this final section. And that's, the, that's the questions that are asked that I te was telling you about that get answered in Revelation. Okay? It's important to understand. Um, verse 43, whereas you saw iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Who will? They shall mingle themselves with the seed so of The seed of men will mingle themselves with the seed of men? What are we talking about? This is, this is a clue to what's going to go on in that time. There will be a re restoration of ancient worship. And there will be some, it'll be mixed up. And Pastor Mark's talked about this in the Revelation study. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I don't, I don't have time to do it justice. But I just want to point it out for those of you that have been in the Revelation study. This scripture right here is very key, very key to understanding what the ten toes are going to be like. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a kingdom. It's a great mixture of that which is, we might call angelic or supernatural plus the iron of the earthly kingdom. It's all going to be mixed together at that time. And they will not cleave to one another, even as iron's not mixed with clay. They'll be together, but they just won't cleave. They'll be different. There'll be two separate things going. That's why there's a seventh and an eighth kingdom, I believe. It's like these two kingdoms that both represent the same basic thing. Okay? And in the days of these kings, this day in the future from Daniel's perspective and from ours, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. That kingdom will never be destroyed. Notice that the head of gold kingdom gets passed on to the silver, gets passed on to the brass, then to the iron, and all this kind of stuff. Um, the feet of iron, st stone, the kingdom of heaven will never be destroyed. Okay. And the kingdom which shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces, consume all these kingdoms, and will stand forever. 
For as much as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces, the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. Daniel knows what he's talking about. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face, worshipped Daniel, commanded they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing you could reveal this secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man, gave him many great gifts, made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king that he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, and Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So understand, when you look at a kingdom like this, one of the things that we're going to see if we talk more about historically, there's a king in Babylon. There's also a king in other cities. There's a ruler. You know, we, we might call him a governor or a mayor or whatever. But there were kings all over the place. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of kings of his time. He was over all of it. So Daniel is sitting with him in his court but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are over the province. The province is much bigger. It's a big area. So, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's sitting in his palace in Washington, D.C., but he's over Montana. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going out all over the place and doing stuff. And that's why we're going to find they're separated from Daniel when we get to the fiery furnace. Mm -hmm. and Daniel's in his place doing what he does, and they're out over all these provinces, right? Okay. And Daniel sent the gate of the king. So chapter 2, from the standpoint of understanding things that shall come to pass, the most important thing is this vision. It's a vision that most any student of the Bible knows very, very, very well. It's been talked about, interpreted many times, but the interpretation is sure. It's already been given, so nobody argues. We all know what that means. As we move forward, this is going to be a basis of what we see. Now notice something about this vision. It's great and mighty and terrible and it looks so wonderful, and men look at this statue and think of how great it is. When we get to some further visions, their visions are the same thing, but they're going to be looked at from a different perspective. So I always say, this is man's perspective. He sees these great kingdoms. It's what man sees. When we get to the visions that Daniel has later, we're going to get God's perspective of what these kingdoms are like. And they're great beasts, tearing and destroying and whatever so, so man looks at him and goes oh they're so mighty god looks at him and goes they're so destructive and it's going to be the difference that you see so any questions about this vision in chapter two this is the principle of interpretation in daniel going forward let the bible interpret itself everybody follow simple enough no problem so flitch next slide let me see where we're at chapter three i didn't put much on here on purpose you can write in what you want chapter three we're going to read is the story that everybody knows from a kid of the fiery furnace. So what does Nebuchadnezzar decide to do? I like that image. Yeah. I like being the head of gold. I think I'll set one up. So verse 1 of chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits, the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in where? Babylon. The province of Babylon. Where was, where was Daniel? In the king's palace. Where was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? In the province of Babylon, right? See what, why they're separated now? Okay. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, the bureaucracy, that's what I like to call it, to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Because he's just so excited to be the king of kings, you see. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the bureaucracy were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that he had set up. And a herald cried aloud to you, it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. <coughs> That's the plan. And whoso does not fall down and worship shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a burning fiery furnace. So you notice how the king says, you either tell me the dream and the interpretation or I kill y'all. Make your houses a dunghill. You know, I mean, this guy does not mess around. <laughs> it's very clear. So you either bow down or we throw you in the fiery furnace. That's it. That's your choices. Very clear. Okay. Therefore, at that time, when everybody heard all the music, 
They fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king set up. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of all the music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever doesn't fall down and worship should be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I, image which I have set up? Now if you are ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet and the music, you will fall down and worship the image which I have made, well... But if you do not worship, you're going to be cast the same hour in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that should deliver you out of my hands? Oh, he just challenged the God of God, didn't he? He just did. He just said very clearly, what God, what God do you serve is going to challenge me? Because I'm telling you right now, I got power over you, and you don't do what I say, I'm throwing you in a fiery furnace. Don't, you know, these, these guys are just crazy. It's just amazing. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. In fact, we're not having struggle here. So we're not having any problem with this answer. That's what he's saying. We're not being political. We're not trying to find a way out of it. We're going to answer you straight up, right? We're not careful to answer. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace, he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. They had determined they would stand with their God, no matter what. Just like Daniel had determined for all of them that they were not going to defile themselves in the king's matter. That was a fairly easy one to start with. You know, give us ten days, you judge. Now it's a little harder. And cast you in a fiery furnace. And then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. He's going to make certain, right? He commanded the most mighty men in his army to bind them and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. These men were bound in their coats, their hoses, their hats, and other garments, and they're cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took them and threw them in. Now, I'm going to get a different book. This is very fun. I'm going to take the time to do this. I wasn't certain I would, but I'm going to do it. This is a copy of the Song of the Three Holy Children. Now, it's written in a very funny way because this is the 1611 version of the King James. So you think the King James is tough to understand? It's tough. So I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. But it is a prayer that Azariah prays. He's standing there. They're about to throw him in. And he begins to pray. And here's some of the stuff. He begins to pray to the God of gods. He says, To whom you have spoken and promised that you would multiply their seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand that lies upon the seashore. For we, O Lord, are become less than any nation and are kept under this day in all the world because of our sins. What's he, what's he doing? He's repenting for the sins of Israel. That's how they got in this state. When they were under Solomon, when they were under David, they ruled over the other nations pretty much. You know, like I said, secular history doesn't want to believe that, but it's true. They ruled over. But now they're underneath the power of Babylon because of their sins, and he knows it, so he's crying this out. Neither is there at any at this time prince or prophet or leader or burnt offering or sacrifice or oblation or incense or place to sacrifice before thee and to find mercy. There was no, under the law, you brought your sacrifice to the altar and then you slew it and you laid your hands on it and committed it before the Lord and you, and you made sacrifice to him for various things and to have your sins taken away and covered. And, and they, they didn't have any place. They had nothing. They had no place of relationship with God. But listen to this. Nevertheless, in a contrite heart and a humble spirit, let us be accepted. Does that sound New Testament or what? 
Like as under the burnt offering of rams and bullocks, and like as the ten thousands of fat lambs, so let our sacrifice be in thy sight this day, and grant that we may wholly go after you. For they shall not be confounded that put their trust in you. This is Azariah's prayer. Then I, again, I just don't want to read this whole thing, but they throw him in, and the angel of the Lord comes down into the oven together with Azariah and his fellows and smote the flame of fire out of the oven. Maybe one of the reasons why those other guys were killed. I don't know. And made in the midst of the furnace that there had been a moist, whistling wind, so the fire did not touch them at all and did not hurt nor trouble them. Then the three, as out of one mouth, praised, glorified, and blessed God in the furnace, saying, and they begin to bless God. And there's a long prayer of just blessing unto the Lord. It is so much fun to add that in because we're going to read this little story here. And, you know, it just doesn't do justice to the greatness of these guys stand with God, which was amazing. And so the Nebuchadnezzar has them thrown in. And these three men, verse 23, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down unto the midst of the burning fiery furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonied. He rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Didn't we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said, True, O king. He answered, Lo, I see four men. Loose. We just read a little bit how, you know, <laughs> the angel of God came down and joined with them, right? Yeah. He answered said, well, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Yeah. And then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fire of Ferdus and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth, come hither. When they came forth in the midst of the fire, and the princes, governors, captains, kings, counselors, and all the bureaucracy being garnered, gathered together, saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was their hair or their head singed, their coats changed, or the smell of fire passed on them. That's a miracle. <laughs> <coughs> this is amazing. And Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word. He said, they changed my mind. That's amazing. Um, that and which, I just lost my spot again. Um, I'm, let me go back. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, "Blessed be the God of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel, delivered his servants that trusted him, have changed the king's word, yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. <coughs> Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, language, speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made of dunghill. He's still got his same ways of dealing with people. It hasn't changed, but he does it. Because there's no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted them in the province of Babylon. So he made them even higher. <coughs> because he had declared it. So we have this amazing story of what's going on here. What is God doing? He is declaring before the princes and kings of men that he is the God of gods. And he's making it real clear that they know. Did he do that with Pharaoh? He absolutely did. He showed him. Pharaoh hardened his heart, would not listen to the word of God. God showed him. Now he's doing the same thing with Babylon. You can, you can be assured he did the same thing with Assyria. Remember, God sent an angel, killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night to protect Hezekiah. You think maybe they didn't know about that? I think they knew. It's a tough thing to study out, but you can find clues in ancient history that something went on and, and that the, the king had to pull back. Because, I mean, when you lose that many men in your army, that's going to hurt your ability to go on. And there's evidence that that happened. So here he does. He declares him before the king of Babylon. Know of a surety that God is God. Right? That's, what, that's what's going on here. And it's amazing. And he promotes him in the province of Babylon. So flip the slide to the next one. Let me see what's next. Okay. So I want to do chapter 4, and then I'm going to take a break. Chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar is going to dream another dream. And, and we're going to read about it. And it's very different from what we're going to see in the future. This one's concerning him himself, in a sense, and the story I just basically told you about the fact that God's going to declare who he is. This you can find in secular history, only it doesn't say all this. You can find that Nebuchadnezzar is conquering everybody 
He's wiping out things left and right. He's doing mighty works of war to declare everything around. And then suddenly there's this pause. It's just a pause. He just stops. There's nothing in there. And then at the end, suddenly he's back and he's wiping things out again. And this is where their chronology gets really messed up because he conquers Egypt, according to Jeremiah, according to Ezekiel, witnesses who were there and who testified of it beforehand and declared that it was going to happen and it happened and then secular history tell you it never happened. Because their chronology is so screwed up that they can't find Nebuchadnezzar conquering Egypt. Because when you read the, the Chaldean Chronicles, it just stops. It just stops. It's lost. Nobody has it. And they get it all confused. But we'll talk about more of that a little bit more later. But this is an important story because you can find that Nebuchadnezzar, who's out conquering everything, just suddenly stops. And we're going to find out why. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, unto all the people, nations, languages, dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God has wrought towards me. So basically, this is all it's like Nebuchadnezzar testifying of God. Okay? That's, that's pretty wild, isn't it? I thought it good. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. He's now understanding that his great image he set up is going to get wiped out by a stone, not cut out with hands. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, astrologers, and bureaucracy, and told the dream before them that they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But at the last, Daniel came in before me. Why is Daniel always at the last, you know? Mm. Whose name was Belteshazzar. But it's really because God makes it real clear that these other guys got nothing. Right. They got nothing. Let them do, it's just like uh, uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Go ahead, keep crying. Maybe he's gone on vacation. Keep, keep going. Are you done now? All right, let me do this. And he just prays, right? But at last Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubles me thee. Tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. <clears throat> and he actually tells him the dream this time. Thus were the visions of my head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and the height thereof was great and the tree grew, was strong. The height thereof reached unto the heavens and the sight thereof the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair and the fruit thereof much and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it. The fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof and all the flesh was fed of it. This is a great tree. And I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed and behold a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, hew down the tree. Cut off the branches, shake off the leaves, scatter the fruit. Let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass and the tender grass of the field. <coughs> and let it be wet with the dew of heaven. And let its portion be with the beast and the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's. Let a beast's heart be given unto him and let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and give it to whomsoever he will and sets up over it the basest of men. Isn't that wild? The basest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation. But you're able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. And the king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate you, and the interpretation thereof to your enemies. He's going, I'm sorry, man, this is against you. The tree you saw, which grew, was strong, whose height reached to heaven, the sight thereof for all the earth, whose leaves are fair, and fruit was much, and meat for all, and beasts could dwell under it, and branches and fowls had their habitation. It's you. O king, you are grown and become strong. Thy greatness is grown and reaches unto heaven and thy dominion to the end of the earth. At this time, Babylon rules over every, pretty much every known kingdom. Okay? I mean, this is, this is powerful stuff. 
This is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they will wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times, or seven years, will pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomsoever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, after you shall have known the heavens do rule. In other words, you get to keep the kingdom, but you're going to find out that the heavens rule over it. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of your peace, your tranquility. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. He spoke and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom of the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from you. They shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they will make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times will pass over thee until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. At the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and ate grass as oxen. His body was wet with the dews of heaven. His hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, his nails like bird's claws. Do you know that if you read medical textbooks, this is actually exists? There is a mania that actually does this. So something happened to him. At the end of the days... I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven, among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What do you do? At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Um, let me just check the time. I might, I might do quickly chapter 5, too, because it's actually a better break. But I want to comment on this. It's important that we understand, as we go forward in Daniel, we're going to be talking about things that are going to come to pass. Remember that a lot of this was said, the first dream that we got through with the, the head of gold and all that, it's something that's happening in the future. But what this is making very clear to us is God does not forget who he's dealing with today. So 100 years ago, there were men on the earth walking with Jesus Christ. God was dealing with them, even as he deals with us today. And for them, they would have seen these things that were going to come to pass, and it's important to think about the things that have come to pass, but he was dealing with Nebuchadnezzar right then. Why did he deal with Nebuchadnezzar this way? Well, he got glory from it, because he testified of who he was, so that Nebuchadnezzar's and his pride was broken. But notice what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He begins to declare, God is God. That's a little bit different than what you see Pharaoh doing. Right? Pharaoh really hardened himself. But God loves Nebuchadnezzar. And he's allowed him to be set up, and he's giving him opportunity to repent. And he does it in a pretty mighty way. You know, he does the same for every single one of you. He gives you opportunity to repent of your sin, of your lack of passion, of your lack of care, of your lack of concern for the poor and for the needy, for those that need to hear the gospel and those that need to be delivered. He, he, he hears us when we cry and say, oh Lord God, let make me like you. I want to be like you. I want to be like Jesus. I mean, he deals with us today. So as we do this, I don't want us to forget, this chapter was to remind me to say these things, to say that God is dealing with us right now, even though we're talking about things that are going to come to pass someday and he dealt with Nebuchadnezzar then and in the time of Cyrus and in the time of Darius and in the time of Belteshazzar or Belshazzar not Belt Belteshazzar is Daniel Belshazzar is a later king of Babylon we're about to read about and in all this he's dealing with them just like he's dealing with us so it's very important that we understand that in all of this okay chapter five quickly Belshazzar. Who is Belshazzar? 
There's no king of Babylon who's Belshazzar in secular history. Very hard to find. Most people believe we found him. He was the regent under a Nabonidus, who subsequent to Nebuchadnezzar. So he was probably Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. Maybe great-grandson, but grandson. And there had been two other kings, probably brothers, and one of those brothers was Nabonidus, and he's the king, and his son, Belshazzar, is the regent of Babylon. Okay? So this is important to understand. Because if you go and you ask some secular historian, where's Belshazzar? They're oh, no, nobody knows. You know. No, he's there. Okay? Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem that the king and the princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, wives and concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and brass and iron and wood and stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote, came out and started writing, isn't that a while? Just this disembodied hand sticks out and starts writing in the plaster. Okay, and the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts were troubled and the joints of his loins were loosed. In other words, he like wet himself, okay? <laughs> and his knees smote against one another. He just like, this is scary, right? And the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers and Chaldeans and soothsayers. They always go for these guys, you know? And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, whosoever reads this writing and shows me interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and be the third ruler in the kingdom. Because you know who Belshazzar is the second. Exactly. He's the regent, right? Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled. Now he's really worried. Um, and his countenance was changed in him and his lords were astonished. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came unto the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of his, thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. So see, Daniel's like in semi-retirement at this point. Okay. <clears throat> That's what's going on. For as much as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting of dreams, showing of hard sentence, dissolving of doubts, were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called. He will show you the interpretation. <clears throat> so the queen knows where to go. You know. Then was Daniel brought in before the king, and the king spake and said to Daniel, Art thou that Daniel, which are of, of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king my father brought out of Jewry? I have even heard of thee, and the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me. They could not read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof, but they, but they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of thee, that you can make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if you canst read the writing, make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet, have a chain of gold about thy neck, and third ruler in the kingdom." Daniel answered and said before the king, let thy gifts be to yourself. I don't even need that stuff, just keep it. Give thy rewards to somebody else, yet I'll read the writing unto the king and make note to him the interpretation. O thou king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. For the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him, whom he would, he slew, whom he would, he kept alive, whom he would, he set up, whom he would, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, his mind hardened in pride. He was deposed from his kingly throne and took his glory from him. He was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts. His dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men and that he appointed over, over it whomsoever he would. And you, his son, or really his grandson, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart though you knew all this. I mean, he knew that this had happened. Believe me, this was not a secret. But Belshazzar didn't want to humble himself, so he didn't. 
But you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven, and they brought the vessels of his house before thee, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine in them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold and brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, you have not glorified. Wow. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. This is the writing. Mene, mene, tekel ufarshin. That's what it said. And he says this. This is the interpretation. Mene, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel. And he, and he wrote that twice, which is like, it's really finished. <laughs> tekel. Thou art weighed in the balances. You, you are found wanting. Peres, which is, by the way, the same word as ufarsin. A lot of people get confused by this. It's just a slightly different tense. And so he, instead of saying, what, what it says is the kingdom is divided and given, basically the way, Ufarsin basically says the kingdom will be divided, and Daniel says the kingdom is divided. Okay? Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he'd be third ruler of the kingdom. And in that night... In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So we're going to see the king of the Medes and the Persians show up. Pretty amazing, huh? So what we're seeing right there is the change from the head of gold to the belly and, or the arms of silver, which we'll talk about more as we go. So does anybody have any questions about this part? We've done very, very fast, I know. What was, because um, it says the, whoever interpreted the dream would be the third ruler. So who was Belshazzar's dad's name? Nabonidus. Nabonidus. So he was asking, when, he, when I made the reference to the third ruler, that's why I talked about the fact that Belshazzar was probably regent under his father Nabonidus, who might have been very old. But... Belshazzar was probably second ruler in the kingdom. Nabonidus was over him. But Belshazzar ruled in Babylon. Nabonidus may have been over in Assyria. I mean, it's hard to know. Maybe he was retired. You don't, you don't have a lot about that. But Belshazzar was king in Babylon. People say, well, there was no Belshazzar king of Babylon when the Medians conquered it. Yes, there was. He was the regent. Okay? He was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. And they wipe it out. So that gets into secular history stuff. Nabonidus, N-A-B-O-N-I-D-U-S, is one way to spell. The other thing about ancient names, they are spelled so many different ways and transliterated so many different ways, you don't get too locked into any of them. Nebuchadnezzar is Nebuchadrezzar. He's Nebuchadnezzar. He's Neb you know, he's, he's got lots of different ways to spell it. Because you're, you're translating out of clay tablets with little wedges stuck in them. I mean, it's kind of weird. Okay, so... Father, we thank you. Any other questions before we go? Let's take a break, you know, go to the bathroom, get some water, do whatever you got to do, and then we will start attacking the things that are going to come to pass.